So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, with Dr. Carissa Wickens from University of Florida. Today, one of our topic is going to be manure management, um, especially on equine operations. And um, we're just going to take a little bit of time to go through some of her PowerPoint, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So um, if any of you have specific questions as we go through it, um, you can either send them to me via Zoom chat or through the Facebook Live. Um, so, Dr. Wickens, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. It's great to be with you all today. Um, just a, a brief little bit more background. Um, I have an extension outreach appointment with the University of Florida in the Department of Animal Sciences and manure management and a little bit more broadly best management practices for equine facilities particularly here in Florida, has been a, a huge educational need and definitely an area that we've been pretty focused in, both from a state specialist perspective, but a lot of our county faculty, county agents are working in this area just to try to, to help you all, um, you know, as you're managing, especially if you have smaller acreage properties and managing horses on small acreage, Figuring out what to do with our manure is certainly a challenge. Um, so, so we'll go through some of this and then yes, definitely a, a chance hopefully for some discussion and some Q&A. I will mention this again at the end, but I did just want to bring up through the LSU Ag Center, um, the website, you guys in Cooperative Extension also have a really nice series of equine best management practices related to water quality protection, educational documents. So there is kind of a, a plethora, like a series, if you will, of um, manure management, pasture management, talks a little bit about just the importance of water quality protection. You know, why do we care about this? Why does it matter? And what can the equine industry, our sector, do to, to help mitigate some of those water quality concerns or impairments? Um, so I'll reference that again when we get to the end, but you guys definitely have a, a great resource repository there for LSU on this topic, which is fantastic. So we will go ahead and get started here. Oh, I am trying to advance my slides here and we are having a there we go. All right. So in today's topic, we're going to discuss the whys and hows of composting as at least one method of manure management on site. There's certainly some other things um, that I'm sure that you guys are familiar with and that we also do, do here on Florida Equine Operations. We don't have to just compost manure, but the focus of today will be this as one potential option for you on your farm. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the advantages of composting in particular, why we, we like to use this method for manure management, and we'll give you some, some tips, how to talk about some strategies, and give you some resources to get you started. So I know most of us as horse folks, you know, we want to spend a majority of our time just working with our horses, riding, enjoying their company, grooming, working with our kids and our families on our farm. Um, but manure is certainly a part or an aspect of, of operating and owning horses and horse facilities. But I think a lot of the times, you know, we think of it probably first and foremost as a waste. We may not think of it any differently, um, but I will certainly challenge you guys throughout this talk today to, to maybe look at this a little differently um, if you aren't already. So yes, is it a waste? Yes, it's a waste product. It's basically undigested feed material, things that our horses are not utilizing in their, their bodily systems that's coming out the other end, so to speak. So it is a waste product. Um, is it a nuisance? It can be a nuisance, certainly if it's not managed properly, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Is it a nutrient source? And definitely, yes, there are nutrients in our manure and our stall waste that can be beneficial if used appropriately and managed appropriately. Um, costly disposal issue, um, depending on um, you know, where, where you're located and how big your operation is, the number of horses you have, if you can't manage it effectively on your property, then potentially in some cases you're actually 
you know, expending money, there is a cost associated with having it disposed of. So hauled off your property, for example. Um, for some of our folks here in Florida, that can cost anywhere from 180 up to $250 a month to, to have a roll off dumpster and have a company come and haul your manure away. So it is a disposal method, but it can be quite costly. Source of disease. Um, certainly when we have disease outbreaks or concerns, manure and, and animal waste can be a source of pathogens. Um, typically when we think of manure and urine from a horse, especially in the, in the poop and in our bedding, our spent bedding material, we can have pathogens such as E. coli, salmonella, uh, clostridium bacteria, things like that. And so we need to maybe think about how we can manage our manure to reduce the risk of exchanging or spreading those pathogens. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that idea a little bit throughout the talk too. So we all know manure happens. I, I chose to use a little bit more polite word here, I think. Um, we can definitely fill that in with, with another word. Um, but we're talking generally about the feces, the urine, but also the bedding material. So any of us that are keeping horses in stalls, even for part of the day, or if we happen to be putting bedding material in their run out shelters or sheds, then we've got bedding material as part of this, this waste stream as well. Um, and that can be anything from shavings or pelleted wood bedding to straw or spent hay or some of the more interesting kind of newer products such as cardboard bedding, peat moss, even hemp bedding material and so forth and so on. Um, so bedding material is part of this waste as well. So again, we mentioned potentially a source of nutrients and absolutely. Um, so we can have some beneficial nutrients that can be utilized in this material. We'll talk about that more too. And then in terms of manure management, this obviously requires responsible action. So the two major things we're talking about is storage. So how and where are we going to keep this material on our property in an appropriate proper man management uh, strategy on our, on our property? And then also disposition. So are we actually able to utilize and apply this material on our, on our properties or facilities? or do we literally need to dispose of it and move it off the property? And so one of the things with composting that we'll talk about is this may be at least a way to think about how to better store, but also manage and reduce the amount of material that you actually have to dispose of in the end if you can't utilize all of this material, for example, on your pastures. So we usually think of this as mount manure. Um, if you guys think about just one thousand pound horse that you own or that you manage on your facility, this a thousand pound horse will defecate. So we're talking about this horse pooping anywhere from four to 13 times per day. In total then, if we're thinking about our urine and our manure that's produced, this one thousand pound horse per day will produce anywhere from 35 to 50 pounds of manure. If we extrapolate this on an annual level per horse, this one horse is producing around nine tons of manure per year. And per ton, this waste stream, the manure and urine, contains about 11 pounds of nitrogen, two pounds of phosphorus, and eight pounds of potassium per ton. This will vary certainly in terms of our feeding management. So what type of diet this horse is on, um, it'll depend a little bit on the physiological status or class of the horse. You know, is this a lactating broodmare? Is it a high, high working, heavy working performance horse? Is it a horse at maintenance? And so feeding practices and, and the type of horse and what we're doing with the horses will alter this to a point. Um, the only way you'll actually know what's in your manure that's produced is if you take it to your livestock waste testing lab, which most of us have. I believe LSU does have a, a livestock waste um, where you can actually take your manure and have the nutrient content analyzed. We have something similar here in um, University of Florida as well. Um, so if we're talking about this mount manure, you guys see the picture on the bottom here. That is multiple horses at a facility. Um, this picture actually is an old picture, but it happens to come from the Michigan State University horse teaching unit many years ago. They've got some different better practices in place for sure now, but at the time, this was basically a way to store temporarily their manure. It is on an impervious pad. It's on a concrete pad but it's close to the barn. It got 
quite unsightly, quite huge. And so coming up with practices of how to dispose of this became very, very critical. And we have a lot of this around some of our bigger equine facilities in particular, where we have, you know, 30 or 40 horses on a property. And, you know, this, this mount manure is very realistic um, if we're not careful. So managing it in a way that's, that's appropriate is very important. We're talking about 2.4 cubic feet per day that's produced when we also account for bedding material. So again, if we have shavings or straw that we're stripping with the waste, with the manure and the urine from a stall, we're actually getting this cubic feet produced per day from, from this horse. In total then, on an annual basis, they can, this can be as much as 876 cubic feet per year or 32 cubic yards. So the way I like to think about this, the picture kind of shows an example of this, but if you guys think of one horse producing this amount of manure, let's say you have a 12 by 12 box stall. Basically, you would fill that 12 by 12 box stall from the floor all the way to the ceiling or the top of the barn with just the annual waste that's produced from one horse. So that is a lot of material to have to deal with. So let's talk about the why. This is important from the standpoint of reducing impairments to our water bodies. If we're protecting water quality, what we're trying to do, what the ultimate goal is, is to prevent or at least reduce the nutrient loading that we have to ground and surface waters. And in particular, the nutrients that we're most concerned with are nitrogen and phosphorus. And particularly when we think about nitrogen, we're very concerned about nitrate levels. Nitrate is not only a potential um, human risk in terms of drinking water, if we have too, too much nitrate in, in that water source, but also in terms of surface bodies of water, if we have too much nitrogen going into these water systems, we can end up with harmful algae blooms. These pictures here, um, the top picture is actually from Jacobs Point in Benton, Louisiana. The bottom picture is Red Bayou in Gilliam, Louisiana. And this is an example of these harmful algae or blue-green algae blooms. Ultimately, what this can do is, if we think about these water bodies being important for fishing and swimming and recreation, certainly that's going to have a, a negative impact on those recreational activities, but also in terms of the overall health of the ecosystem. So if we get these harmful algae blooms, we're reducing dissolved oxygen in these waterways, and so we can have fish kills um, and we can have a lot of uh, negative environmental impacts. So proper management of manure plays a very important role. And this doesn't mean that you know, equine industry sectors or horse facilities were not the only contributors, certainly. Other sectors of the agricultural industries, as well as lawn and turf grass, parts of, of our um, economy and, and of our agricultural systems. There's a lot of other what we call non-point source um, you know, discharge of these nutrients. But as horse owners, we can certainly do our part to help mitigate this and to be good stewards of the land. So that's where our role comes in. So composting manure, why compost? There's some real benefits here. Um, the first being a production of a more homogeneous material. So if you guys look at the material in this bin here, it's harder and harder to distinguish with composting individual road apples and large particle sizes of bedding. So we get this much better mixture of this homogeneous material that ultimately then is much easier to spread and to manage. So whether we're temporarily storing this material, disposing of it off site, or land applying it, we get this much nicer, easy to spread material. It's usually drier, and again, the particle size is smaller, so we're not smothering or covering our pasture grasses. We're actually able to use this to our benefit when we land apply. It may, in some cases, even have marketability value. Um, we know that compost with the organic matter, the organic material that's in compost, we can actually have this be a very beneficial soil amendment. So I'm not as familiar with um, the topography and the types of soils that you guys have throughout Louisiana, but here in Florida, we're known for our very sandy soils. We, do, we don't have very much organic material in our soils, so that really diminishes the ability of that soil to hold water, to hold moisture and nutrients. And so if we can incorporate this organic matter through the compost into our soils, that definitely improves soil quality 
and overall soil water um, holding capacity, which is great for our pasture grasses and our other plants. It's also useful as a growth media. Um, so examples of this would be if folks are actually raising or trying to propagate worms, um, but also for like rose gardens and that kind of thing, it can be a very good growth media. As a mulch, so depending on the type of bedding you're using and your composting process, you can actually use this as a mulching material. And then certainly with the nutrients that are present, we can use this as a slow release fertilizer. So it takes a little bit longer for the nutrients to be released from the compost when it's land applied. It's a slower process, hence slow release. They're a little bit more stable when they're in the compost uh, material. So also with composting, um, if we have this really nice process where we get a good finished product, it should look very similar to soil. So we get this dark, rich, hummusy material that actually has an earthy smell. It will no longer smell like stall waste or manure. And overall, on average, we can see anywhere from a 25 to 50% volume reduction. So we can start with this huge pile of manure, but if we're actively composting, generating heat, and helping this pile break down more effectively, we can take that huge mountain and start to reduce that volume over time. We also then, with the heating process and composting, we do destroy pathogens. So when I mentioned E. coli and salmonella, we can get significant reductions of some of those pathogens and bacteria. But we also can have some benefit, added benefit, of destroying weed seeds. So again, in a pasture system, if you're land applying raw manure versus a compost, the raw manure, you do run the risk of further spreading weed seeds and incorporating weeds and nuisance plants in your good pasture grass. But if we heat this pile and we compost it effectively, we reduce that risk. So we, we kind of mitigate spreading weeds back onto our fields and onto our pasture grasses. And that's partly the, the benefit of composting as well. Um, one other thing I should mention is, again, if we're heating this material, if we think about, you know, doing our fecal egg counts and deworming horses, this is another management method that can help reduce parasite issues as well. So we're going to destroy those eggs, we're going to mitigate some fly issues if we're prop properly storing, managing, and, and potentially composting is a great way to reduce those, those parasite issues. So I don't want to take too long to get into the, the hardcore science here of composting, but just so that we understand and have a little bit of background. In terms of composting principles, essentially we are taking advantage of the same process that we see with natural decomposition. However, we're expediting or accelerating this, this decomposition process by mixing our stall waste, this organic material, with other ingredients in a manner that optimizes microbial growth and utilization such that we get better, more effective breakdown of this material and that we actually end up with, with a very nice product at the end that's more usable. So we have our raw manure, this organic material that includes the feces, urine, bedding, maybe some spent feed. So if we're tossing some of our hay out with, you know, whatever hay they didn't eat that morning or that afternoon, if that's going out with our waste, that's added as well. And then, of course, in a natural environment and a system, we've got soil, water, and then these natural or microorganisms or microflora that are in the soil and present in the material that are going to help break it down. We get some generation of water and heat in the composting process. We will get some um, release or generation of gases. We do see um, ammonia, carbon dioxide, some methane, and nitrous oxide through this process. But ultimately what we're doing is we're taking this, this process and we're getting this nice uniform mixture on what, what we call this hummus or hummified organic matter, mineral matter and microorganisms, and that's helping to reduce the overall mass and water content of this product or material. So again, at the end, we should get this nice soil rich looking material that we can utilize. Okay. So how do we do this? Um, what's a great way to get started? So we're going to talk now a little bit about building a compost system. So one of the first things is locating where you're going to establish this, this compost system, or in general, this also applies to where we should think about locating our manure storage. 
This is certainly much easier to do at the outset, like if we're in the process of identifying a, a property or some acreage where we want to establish a horse facility, this is a little bit easier because we have kind of first stab at, at establishing locations of our outbuildings, um, our barns and that kind of thing, and especially with our manure storage. Most of the time though, we are acquiring properties where there's already certain structures um, on the site or we're just really far down the pipeline in this process. So it's kind of retrospective where we can think about, you know, hey, can I, can I locate this in a better, more ideal location that's more proper from the terms of, of protecting water quality. So location of pile, um, we, have, we have some kind of rules of thumb here. They might vary slightly for your specific location, but in general, we want to find a fairly flat site away from low-lying areas. Um, certainly when we have hurricanes coming through our region, we get flooding um, and it's hard to avoid that in some situations. But locating your manure in a site that's a little bit more flat and not in one of those low-lying areas is going to, to help protect that pile and reduce again, water quality impairments from runoff during those flooding events. We wanna try to be 300 feet away from public potable wells 200 feet away from water courses, such as like retention ponds and canals or ditches. And certainly um, that rule of thumb also applies for sinkholes, which we have plenty of those here in Florida. So we do have to think about that. And then 100 feet away from your private potable well. The other consideration here in terms of nuisance factors is being considerate of your neighbors and adjacent properties. Um, so trying to have your manure storage area or your composting bin area out of view and downwind from your neighbors. So making sure that it's not right up against the fence next to your neighbor, particularly if they are not horse owning neighbors, just trying to be good stewards and, and build good neighbor relations as well. So a little bit of the how to here um, for y'all. And then again, this is where we have some great resources for you. Managing the pile. So there's a couple different ways we can do this. We can have freestanding piles, but it's much more manageable and much more conducive to more effective composting if we can come up with some kind of structure where we can actually have sort of a bin system. It just makes it much easier to manage all of this. Also, by having at least a two or three sided structure where you're storing and, and compiling this material, you're gonna help reduce runoff. When we have a rain event, if you have water infiltrating your manure storage area, if you have siding to it, it is going to help prevent some of that runoff, which is very important. Um, so we do, we do talk about constructing bins and I've got some tips and tools for, for how you guys can get started on that. And we can do that very inexpensively in many cases. But generally, if we're talking about getting started with composting, we wanna manage the pile to have a minimum pile size for effective composting. We need to monitor temperature. We may need to um, manually aerate or statically aerate these piles or bins. We need to make sure the moisture content is adequate. So adding water in some cases, amending the pile with nitrogen. If our carbon to nitrogen ratio is maybe not quite ideal and we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, so these are generally just some, some parts of the composting process. So I did mention here on this last bullet point, our carbon to nitrogen ratio should be around 25 to 30 to one parts carbon to nitrogen. Raw horse manure is actually already in itself quite close to this ideal ratio, but that will depend a lot on if we're really dealing with just raw manure, picking up piles, raw piles out in our paddocks and adding it to a bin system, or if we are collecting this from stalls and especially if we're stripping stalls and we have a lot of bedding material with this, that is going to alter that, that carbon to nitrogen ratio and we can start to get fairly far from ideal such that our pile may not heat up appropriately or may not decompose like we want it to. So we'll come back to some of these ideas in more depth in just a minute. But you guys will notice here on temperature, I have a range of 130 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That is where we want to target heating these, these piles to have effective composting. If we fall below these temperatures, we're actually not heating the pile sufficiently to let those natural microorganisms utilize and break down this material effectively but if we get too hot, if we have hot temperatures that are too high, 
we actually may kill off some of those beneficial bugs. And then again, we're not gonna have effective composting. So 130 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of the target. If it gets up closer to 160, that's often perfectly all right as well. But we wanna try to not get too much higher than that 160 mark. And to kill pathogens and weed seeds, we wanna maintain these temperatures for around 21 days. We actually need to maintain these higher temperatures for about two to three weeks to actually get this effective breakdown of weed seeds and other pathogens. We want a pile or a compost that is not too moist, but also not too dry. We have to have kind of a happy medium. What we're targeting is about 50 to 60% moisture. There are commercial moisture meters out there that you can buy and you just stick the long stem moisture meter into your compost and it will give you a percentage or, or basically tell you what your moisture level is in that pile. But there's also a really easy trick um, just doing by hand and eye where you basically just pick up a, a portion of that material, place it in your hand. When you squeeze it, it should feel relatively speaking like the consistency of a wrung out sponge. So if I hold this material in my hand, I don't want it so dry that it's just crumbling apart in my hand, but I also don't wanna hold it in my hand, squeeze it and have running water dripping through my hand. That material is gonna be much too wet. And again, that can create some issues with proper decomposition and getting a nice finished product. Um, we also talked about having a big enough pile. I mentioned um, one cubic yard here. Visually, what that would be, if you guys picture your washer or dryer, like your washing machine in your house, one cubic yard is about the size of that washing machine. So to get this pile to start even heating appropriately, we have to have that one cubic yard, that size pile to really have an effective composting process get started. So sometimes if you're having trouble, you may just not have a big enough pile amassed to begin with and you can add more material. Okay, so I mentioned the ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio. This table actually comes from one of the University of Florida previous graduate students who worked with one of our other faculty. Um, this is from a thesis project where they were actually comparing the nutrient contents of compost and stall waste based on different types of bedding materials. So if we look here, it gives the percent nitrogen, the percent carbon, and then it literally lists that carbon to nitrogen ratio by comparing the proportion of nitrogen to carbon in this material. So if you look at this table, if we're using spent bahia grass hay, for example, as a bedding material, we have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 33 to one. And that's pretty close to that ideal ratio. If we use straw, again, we're not too far off of that ideal C to N ratio, but we're starting to get a little bit higher with that type of bedding material. And then if you guys look at the wood shavings, what do you see there? We have a, a pretty significant increase in that C to N ratio, which at this point, we have a lot of carbon and not very much nitrogen. So a lot of the times with wood shavings, it's gonna take a longer process or we're gonna to have to amend this, this material with nitrogen somehow to help establish that, that more ideal or closer to ideal ratio to help this process. Because we have very, very high carbon content in that wood, wood bedding. So just something to keep in mind in terms of the type of bedding that you're using. This chart actually shows you um, sort of a, a way here, at least with small scale operations, to think about what your bin size should be and how to start setting that up, or at least calculating if I want to store this material and manage this material for a period of roughly four months, it takes about three to four months for this material to completely decompose and compost and be land applicable um, in terms of being ready as a finished hummusy product. So having enough storage space or management space for about four months is where we start. We consider the number of horses that we have. So this, this basically is giving you an example with a two horse property or two horse operation. We look at the volume of manure and bedding generated each day. So again, we're using that estimate of two cubic feet per horse per day times our two horses to get the total cubic feet that is produced on our farm per day. 
And then if we want that four months or 120 days of storage capacity, we're gonna take our amount of manure generated each day, multiply by the number of days storage that we're looking to have, that gives us our total cubic feet in terms of storage capacity that we need. Then if we want to have a two bin system, we're gonna have two separate bins, we can then look at the size of each bin. So my 480 cubic feet divided by two bins tells me what size each bin should be. And so this worked out in this two bin compost system to have two bins that are eight by eight by four feet. The two bins allows you to start putting fresh material in one bin, and then eventually you can either add that material, pick it up, aerate it, turn it, and move it to the second bin, and then start fresh again in your first bin, or as the, the decomposition process is happening, as you're managing your compost, you can use the second bin for fresh material and just keep managing the existing material in bin number one. So there's a couple different options for how you can utilize a two or a three bin system, but it gives you a little bit more storage capacity, gives you a little bit more room to, to actually manage this material and, and play with this. So here are some very um, good examples of some different types of two or three bin systems that have been established on some of the farms locally here in Florida. And some of these are a little bit more sophisticated, maybe a little bit more expensive. But the, the one that's pictured in the photo on the left, um, this is a good example in terms of location. So considering where your setbacks are, you know, those 200, 300, 100 feet setbacks from private wells and water courses or sinkholes, taking that in consideration. But then you guys can see here, this is very much located right behind the barn. So for ease of access, ease of use, as people are cleaning out the stalls at this barn, they just go around the corner and, and dump this in their compost bin system. They have chosen to put an impervious surface. They have concrete as flooring um, to pre prevent leaching of nutrients from their manure piles. Um, that is not necessarily something that we have to do. It's certainly a good idea, but it adds labor and cost. Ideally, you want to have something as your flooring structure that will help reduce leaching of, of water and material down into the soil beneath, but it doesn't necessarily have to be concrete. Packed clay or packed soil of some other type, um, maybe putting some crushed stone dust, some gravel, something that gives you a little bit of a surface is helpful. I've even seen, and there's an example in the next photo here on the right, of people using rubber stall mats or floor mats. So again, it kind of gives you a, a structure, something underneath that prevents leaching, but also makes it a little easier to move material back and forth out of the bins. Um, so the, the system on the left is probably a little bit more costly in terms of putting in the concrete, building the, the wood-sided structures, um, and so forth, but it's a nice example of a two-bin system. You'll notice they have a tarp hanging from kind of the roof of the barn over the pile. Covering these piles, at least um, during heavy rain events, is highly recommended. It is one of our, it's considered a, a BMP, a best management practice in terms of managing and storing manure, regardless of whether we're composting or just dealing with raw manure. Um, covering those piles are gonna prevent it, one, from becoming saturated, being too wet, so that it doesn't break down well, but also in terms of mitigating, again, leaching and runoff from those piles. So I like the, the picture on the right is a little bit more uh, simple design. They just chose a flat site, um, kind of a flat area of their property. This is an example of a three bin system using boards and posts. And a lot of this material can be just from things that you already have laying around the farm. Unused or broken boards, fence posts, anything that you can find around your property, you can actually use to construct one of these bin systems. And again, they've got rubber mats kind of at the front and underneath. And this is another great example where they've covered the piles with tarp. So very cheap, very inexpensive means for, for having these covered. The other thing I will say though, you guys wanna make sure that if you're covering these, especially with tarps, you don't wanna pull it so snug over the compost or the manure material that you're blocking out oxygen and airflow. Um, the microorganisms, part of the composting process is aerobic. It needs air, it needs oxygen. So covering it is good but making sure that they're not so tightly pulled over these, um, or at least leaving some airspace, airflow with slats in your boards to make sure that you're getting some oxygen into these piles, getting some air circulation. These are some other nice examples. Um, this is some really inexpensive lattice work that you can find at the, the Home Garden Center. 
um, they've actually utilized this as sort of their, their walls or the partitions in between their bins. But this is great for allowing oxygen and airflow um, without letting the material kind of cross over the bins or come out of the bins. But this is mostly just materials that they purchased very inexpensively or picked up just around the farm and used to construct or, or basically amass their, their bin systems. The other um, picture here on the left, this actually shows where their posts are slatted. So each one of those fence boards can actually be slid or lifted out from the front so they can keep that material contained at all times. But when they need to get their, their manure in there, when they want to add to the piles or the bins, they can take each of those boards out so that they have freedom to, to move the tractor in and out or their wheelbarrow loads out so that they can put more material in there to manage. Um, this picture on the right also is a nice example. It shows bin one, two, and three. In bin one, this is sort of our fresh, newly collected material. The bin number two, or the, the central bin, has some stuff that's kind of cooked already, has been decomposing. And then in the third bin, you see sort of that hummusy, rich looking soil type material that's our more finished or cured compost. And again, for most of this material, that may take three to four months to effectively get to that point in the process. One more example, um, this is just showing another three-sided bin. This bin system cost the, the property owner, this horse owner, about $1,200 to build. They actually did just go to Lowe's or Home Depot and pick up new lumber, and they, they built their own design and constructed it based on that bin size calculation that I showed you. And then they use this three bins to, basically they pick up their paddocks every day, and then part of the year their horses are in stalls part of the day mostly during the summer months. Um, they have some horses with insect bite hypersensitivity, so they like to keep them in stalls with fans on them during the, the daytime hours, um, just to keep some of the bugs off of them. But they, they take their, their spent stall waste and they add that to the pile. They also use um, leaves, so as they clean up leaves, you know, leaf um, litter around their property, they're adding that as a carbon source into their manure storage bins. This is a really cool example. Um, this is a great way if you want to reduce your time and labor in composting. This is what we call an adapted O2 compost system. So this is an older couple that has two horses on small acreage. They have constructed four storage bins. They're fairly small size, but you guys see the PVC pipes. They actually inject air using a pump system and so they never have to turn this material. They never physically put their pitchfork or their front end loader in these bins. They're kind of closed bins. They, they add material from the top of each bin, takes them about 30 days with the two horses to fill a bin, and then they add moisture as needed with the hose, and they aerate statically just by having air injected from this. So that makes the aeration and the oxygenation pro uh, process much easier and takes away a lot of the time and labor. So it can be a really good um, approach to, to composting. Troubleshooting compost is, is a huge part of this. As much as there's some science behind composting and manure management, there's also an art to it. Um, it takes some practice and some ingenuity and sometimes getting started means that you may have a few frustrations. You kind of have to troubleshoot your way through some of this process. But this is a great chart that shows you what some of the potential problems are and how to fix it and how to amend these piles so that you get better decomposition and a better compost at the end. So for example, if the compost pile or in the bin system, if this material is not heating up appropriately, the pile either may be too dry, it may contain too much bedding, so too much carbon and not enough nitrogen, the pile may also on the flip side be just too saturated, too wet, and it's staying cool and it's not heating appropriately. The pile may also be too small, so making sure that you have enough material to get you started. Um, so adding water, adding commercial fertilizer or another nitrogen source to your pile might be needed, especially if you're using a lot of wood bedding material. Adding more bulking materials and covering, as I mentioned, with a tarp to keep it from getting saturated from rain and building bigger piles. Um, so those are kind of all the, the solutions to some of those problems. Um, one of the things that works really well, I know a lot of our horse folks, um, a lot of us are getting more interested in having backyard birds. So if you have poultry at home, poultry litter, the poultry waste um, that you have, 
that is fairly high in nitrogen. Um, there's a much higher nitrogen profile in poultry litter compared to horse manure. So adding some of that, that backyard poultry litter to your horse manure can be a great way to amend nitrogen fairly naturally. And it'll also help you decompose and get rid of some of your poultry litter if you're cleaning out your coops or your poultry house. Um, some of the other things that we see a lot, um, the compost pile doesn't seem to be breaking down. Again, this might be a moisture issue. Um, it may not be holding heat. So this is where having a long stem compost thermometer to monitor your temperatures at least once or twice a week, just to make sure that your piles are heating and staying hot for a period of time. Um, those are really key troubleshooting tips in terms of this stuff just isn't breaking down for you very well. Um, making sure that, that you're meeting those needs of the microorganisms to help you, to help you break down this material. So just some things in summary. Um, manure management, we know that's also a really important part of, of what we do in terms of horse ownership and facility management. So sometimes I, I think, again, we see this as a nuisance and we may not spend a lot of time or a lot of energy on this aspect of our farms, but it is very important not only for to protect water quality, but again, to maybe mitigate parasites and some disease pathogens. So keeping our overall farm and our horses healthy is also a really important benefit that we see with good manure management practices. Composting accelerates the decomposition of animal waste with some of the following benefits that we touched on. Recycling of this organic material, um, decreasing odor through this process, reducing the overall volume that we have to handle and manage on our facility, and also, um, certainly we talked a little bit about this material ultimately being useful as a soil amendment, adding value to this stall waste stream that we're dealing with. Composting need not be complicated. Customizing a composting system to your specific uh, situation and property to help you um, get started is, is key. So not being overzealous in the design or, or trying to be um, too intricate with this, but maybe just starting small and simple, just to kind of play around with this and see if this is something that can be beneficial for you in terms of managing your manure. Monitoring the piles is really important and then making adjustments to improve the process. And that's where those troubleshooting tips can be very helpful. And then the last thing, um, just there's many resources that we have out there available for you all that can help you not only get started, but manage this a little bit more effectively um, to get a really nice product that again, you're either land applying and utilizing at your own facility, or that maybe you can, you can market or share with others. One thing I do wanna mention, um, when we're talking about using compost or especially raw manure, as a soil amendment or, or putting this out on our pastures and land applying this, if it's going back out in your pasture, this is probably less of a concern. But if you're going to use this as a growth media or a slow release fertilizer or a mulch type of product for your gardens, if you are using certain types of herbicides on your pasture, we have some data that actually demonstrates that there is still herbicide residue in compost. So even finished compost that's gone through this active heating decomposition process, there is still some residual herbicide present. So particularly for um, things like cucumbers and tomatoes, if you're sharing this with a neighbor or, or offering this to a nursery or a grower, you need to be aware of what herbicides you're using and just be forthright in letting people know um, what, what might potentially be in your manure. There's also some really cool little home bioassays that you can perform. So you can actually take a tomato plant and do kind of a, a mixture of potting soil um, media with, with a mixture of your compost and actually look at how those tomatoes are growing in this little miniature bioassay that you can do just to make sure that you're not getting leaf wilt or plants that are stunted. If you're not seeing that, then there's, um, you know, it's demonstrating that your compost would be safe, that it would be appropriate to use for some of those other purposes. Land application is fine. In fact, you might even get some benefit of that residual herbicide in terms of mitigating some of your weed issues. Um, but just keep in mind that you may have some of that issue if you are actively using herbicides to control weeds. Um, in particular, some of the products that contain amino pyrrolid, that compound in particular is pretty hard on tomatoes and some of our other vegetable crops or things that we want to grow. So just to keep that in mind. So with that, um, 
that is all I have, and I'm very happy to take questions. I did mention um, a couple of the resources here. So we have um, University of Florida, our extension pages. We have multiple fact sheets and resources on best management practices, which include manure and pasture management. But in particular, we have some good references on composting. That's where I drew some of the, the tables that show troubleshooting tips and um, figuring out your bin size and your storage capacity. And then, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Walker and the group there at LSU, the Ag Center, there is a series um, devoted to equine water quality. And this talks about manure management, pasture management, helping to prevent leaching of nutrients on your farm and nitrogen, uh, nitrogen cycling, so nutrient cycling on your farm. Um, but that series is really, really helpful. Um, and there's a lot of extra little tips and things that kind of go um, specifically are oriented towards composting and getting started with that process and being successful in that process. Um, so I did include that one here, um, manure, Managing Horse Manure for Environmental Benefits. It's a 2009 publication by the LSU Ag Center. Um, it's Ron Sheffield and a few other authors. That one is available at the link there, but if you go onto the LSU Ag Center uh, website, you can search under publications. There's a catalog of publications. And if you go there, you can just type in composting or horse manure management or water quality. And there's a lot of great resources there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiggins. Um, I do have a few points I'd like to add. Um, you did a great job of kind of explaining to us how we need to compost and why there's a benefit to it. Um, a lot of people I feel like are looking at other options besides composting to help reduce pests and external parasites. Um, and some of the things that I've gotten a lot of questions about recently are some of these feed through um, pest control, fly control. Have you had any experience or have you seen any um, residual of the, the compound that they use in those feed throughs in finished compounding? And does it have any effect if we're gonna spread it back out on our pasture? That is an excellent question, and I, I wish that I, I had some data or had more information on that. I, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg with understanding some of how what we're feeding through is, is coming out in the manure or in the compost. Um, I know one example that we do have some data on is when we are using anthelmintic products. So if we're deworming with ivermectin, Again, we, we have evidence that there's some residue of that product. And of course, we don't want to unbalance some of the ecosystem. Like if we think about dung beetles and how beneficial they are, some of these compounds, if they're more of a pesticide type of product or an anthelmintic type of product, they can have some negative impacts on some of those natural organisms. Um, if we compost, we're certainly reducing that residue. So that's, again, another sort of check mark is a plus for composting because we're probably mitigating some of that or at least reducing it. But I, I don't know. Um, it'd be really neat to have some better data on how those feed throughs and how resi residues or residual product may benefit or maybe even harm and what we need to be careful with. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, so for those of you who are unaware of what we're talking about, there are a couple of different examples of feed throughs um, and I'm gonna just name them just so you guys can go Google them and look them up if you're interested. Uh, a product uh, called Simplify, a product called Equitrol, or another product called Solitude IGR. Um, all of these ha contain a, an active ingredient that inhibits the, fo uh, the formation of um, chitin or chitin, however you want to say it. Basically, it, it inhibits the, the parasites or the flies' ability to build an exoskeleton. So they mature, immature flies will die. It won't address already adult flies, but it will address that immature stage fly. Um, so it reduces, uh, a lot of these products say that they reduce uh, the fly population by up to 97%, which is fantastic. The caveat is that you have to feed it to all of the horses on your property. If you just feed it to one group of horses or one pasture of horses, you're not going to see the fly reduction. Um, but for those of you looking for pest management options, that's something that you can look into. Um, I have lots of um, stakeholders that say that they have had fantastic success with it. Um, however, it's usually um, targeting just the common uh, stable fly. I haven't heard any reports of them actually addressing horse flies or mosquitoes or gnats. So 
there's, there is the, it's not a, a cure-all for all of the things that bother our horses down here in the South. Um, I do have another question as far as, um, you know, for those of us who have horses just on pasture, um, and we're not necessarily managing anything that has um, a high carbon footprint. What, um, what are your recommendations on what we can do if we just have pasture? Should we be picking up that manure? Should we just be letting it ride? What, how can we manage that effectively? I think, and, and again, a lot of our systems are, are just like that. I mean, we, even some of our smaller acreage properties, if they're not keeping horses indoors, they're pretty much outdoors 24 seven, that's where the manure is going. Um, when people have had time, especially if it is very small acreage, they are doing the best they can to, to at least pick up every few few days, maybe a few times during the week. Um, probably the easier thing for most of us to do that we, we talk about a lot is, you know, breaking up those piles, chain harrowing, um, spreading that manure. You're at least spreading those nutrients out. Um, one thing I will say though, probably for our region, for the Southeast, it makes a lot of sense, especially with our really hot summers, to, to take advantage of that, do that during the summer months, because when you spread out those piles, that heat and that sunshine is gonna help kill parasites so that again, you're not spreading it and then giving horses access to that. Our sort of winter months where it's moist and the humidity is still high, but it's kind of cooler weather, that's probably not the ideal time to take advantage of that method, um, just for some other, other reasons. But um, chain harrowing, breaking it up is probably the best if you don't have a lot of time to go out and pick up piles. Um, but that's where, again, if, if you have a composting system, it's kind of nice because if you have a method of removing some of those piles, you're reducing that load on the pasture, but then you're able to incorporate that into the system. And, and that's how you're just adding mostly just nitrogen and not bedding material. Um, but that kind of goes back to the best management practices that we really need to be thinking about when we're planning our horse pastures. I feel mm -hmm. like, especially in Florida and here in Louisiana in those wet months, there is no way that any of us are going to be able to get out there with a chain harrow or even drive into some of those pastures. Walking into the, some of those pastures is always an issue. So um, spreading that out may not even be possible. I mean, we, we're, we're mud farmers at that time of year. Um, well, and I think, I think that's where even just thinking more holistically about protecting water quality. So leaving it out on pasture may not be really detrimental as long as you are, are considering, am I close to a creek? Or, or a pond or a stream bed or something like that where at least if your horses don't have direct access to that open surface body of water, it, you know, those are some of the things too that you can kind of think about as you plan your pastures or what you should be doing with your manure. Um, a lot of our facilities, as long as they're not literally up against a water source or a sinkhole or something like that, it's, it's probably less critical, but still something that people should consider. Right, and here in Louisiana spe specifically, a lot of, especially in the south, so southern part of our state, a lot of our farms do have access to waterways, if not smaller waterways, but some type of, of creek or, or we're, you know, below sea level, most of us are anyhow. Um, yeah. So one of the things I do want to mention and make sure of is that we need to be mindful, like Dr. Wicken said, there are some diseases that can be prevalent, especially if we have foals on pastures um, that do have access to ponds or that are um, lower lying pastures that have access to waterways. Um, and just because I had one happen just last month, so it's fresh on my mind, um, some of those diseases can be fairly harmful long-term. And one of them is leptospirosis. I uh, usually don't think about that in terms of horses, but um, if they do get exposure to that, and that's for those of you who are um, unfamiliar with leptospirosis, uh, it's a bacteria that they can actually multiply and shed through their kidneys, so it comes out in the urine. So if they're urinating or the close to a waterway uh, or a standing pool of water, that other foals or other horses have access to, they then can uptake it and it stays in their system. So they may be exposed while they're young and not have a flare until they're much older, which is the case that happened mm -hmm. to our horse. And how it manifests in these horses is they're gonna have constant chronic uveitis, which can uh, end up, you know, moon blindness or um, eventually leading to retinal issues with these horses and, and long-term blindness, um, which can be a serious issue. So. You know, you, you may not be thinking about manure management or pasture management in a form of overall horse health, but it really can affect all aspects of, of your horse and, and their ultimate longevity. That being said, do any of you guys that are on with us live, do you have any specific questions about, you know, building your pastures or managing them the way that you have them now? Um, 
specific poop problems. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Walker, I was going to say too, you mentioned um, the feed through products. I think sometimes too, and, and I think when we think about other ways to deal with or manage external parasites, especially flies, you know, I get a lot of questions um, about the fly predators and, and how those work and if those are beneficial. But that is certainly when we think about our manure storage areas or, or where we're placing our manure and managing that manure that can actually be a great place to, to kind of distribute or spread those fly predators because that's going to be kind of that concentrated material that flies like to, to lay in and nest and, and lay eggs in. So again, if we're composting and you're taking that outer crust and you're turning it to the center of the pile where it can heat, you're, you're going to kind of, you know, destroy and, and kill some of those, those larvae, certainly, but, but the fly predators can be a, a benefit too. I have heard, my understanding though, is it maybe takes a couple years for those to really establish and to use them over a period of time to see a lot of positive impact. If you just do it one season, you may not see the results. You may have to try those for a while, but certainly putting those strategically around some of your heavy manure pad areas on the farm or by your manure storage can be beneficial. Yeah, and I can't speak to that. We use those pretty frequently. And some of the tips that I've learned over the years is, A, you got to keep your chickens up if you have chickens. If yeah, you're going to put them yeah. on the ground, you got to keep your chickens up. Um, B, sometimes it's just so wet down here that you put them on the ground and bad things happen. So uh, the best way, some of the things that we've done on our farm is we'll hang that bag off of a fence post yeah. and let them hatch and fly out of the bag and kind of go where they need to go from there. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question from Kelly. She says, when you're using a manure spreader on your pasture, uh, what is the best practice to spreading the manure and are there things that we need to be careful of? So um, there's a couple things and I think um, our county agents are often really helpful at, at talking about this and coming out to your property um, essentially to, to kind of just walk your pastures with you and, and talk about this with you. But they can help you. I think one of the, the important aspects with your manure spreader is to make sure it's calibrated um, to the best of your ability. Um, it, it'll depend on the, the type of spreader or what type of equipment you, you have, but making sure that it's not literally spreading too, too quickly or too heavily. One of the things, especially when we have bedding material in this, this material, is if you're spreading it, you don't want maybe more than, than a half inch or even a little bit less in terms of layering that on your pasture. Because what happens, particularly if this is raw product and we have a lot of bedding material in it, that carbon, that extra carbon, you're actually gonna sequester or pull nitrogen out of your, your pasture grasses and, and your, your soil. Um, the microorganisms need nitrogen. And if there's, there's a lot of carbon there, it's going to sequester some of that and, and upset that balance. So I would say just make sure you're not spreading it too thick, just having a very thin layer. And then the other thing with spreaders and putting this in terms of land application, well, two things. Again, it would be interesting. Um, you can send for, for very cheap. You can send this to get analyzed so that you have some idea of what nutrients are in that material. And then you can work with your county agent to conduct a soil test. So you can look at the nutrients in your, in your soils, in your pasture, and then better match that to, to what you're spreading. That will be probably the best piece of information to help assure that you're not spreading too frequently or too much, that you're matching the nutrients to what the pastures actually need. The other piece of this then is when are you spreading? So if you think about our region right now, we're starting to get really warm, longer days. Um, we've had some rain. So our pasture grasses, especially if we've got Bermuda or Bahia, some of these warm season grasses, they're really starting to wake up and they're going to have their, their you know, peak growing season basically like June through August into September. So that's the time when that, that pasture grass is actively growing. It needs and it can utilize those nutrients. We probably don't need or want to be spreading this material during the winter months when our warm season grasses are dormant because they're, it's just sitting there then. They're really not utilizing that, that source of nutrients. Kelly, I'll say as well that you need to be mindful of is making sure that you're not spreading it obviously near a pond or a big muddy patch or something like that. You don't want this to be in any kind of standing water um, if possible. Um, I know sometimes that's inevitable wherever we are. Um, does anybody else have any more questions or um, Dr. Wickens, do you have a, a little soapbox you want to get on and, and give us a final thought? <laughs> um, 
I mean, again, I, I just think that, you know, proper manure management and, and good stewardship of your farm in terms of pastures and manure, I mean, ultimately, yes, you're, you're helping reduce the chance for environmental, negative environmental impacts, but moreover, these are just some great, great opportunities to just improve your overall farm management um, and, and really protect the health of, of yourself and, and your family, but also your horses. Um, you guys can kind of see how manure management, yeah, we're talking about poop, but that's so interrelated with things like external and internal parasite infestations and control. Um, it has a lot to do with just odor and, and nuisance types of, of things on your farm too. So this is all good for, for good health of the farm. Yeah, I'll mention too that um, here, especially just to kind of hit home the point that we're not just taking care of our horses poop problem, right? We're taking care of our entire farm. We're also taking care of the other farms and other agricultural um, entities around us, especially here in Louisiana. Um, if we have coliform, which coliform bacteria is in raw manure, if we get coliform bacteria into any of our waterways, which lead down to, let's say, oyster beds or shellfish beds, those, those beds get shut down. Um, and that is a, a, a real issue as far as supporting other agricultural mm -hmm. entities throughout our state. So we do have a responsibility to take care of our animals and all of the byproducts that they make. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty much it. If anybody else has any more questions, I'll give you just a few more seconds. Um, Dr. Wickens, I really appreciate you coming on um, and sharing with us your successes and the research that y'all have done with um, composting and you know just ways that you can make it easy. Um, and I appreciate everybody else coming on and watching and providing questions. If, any of you have any questions after the fact or if you're watching this after the live event, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us or to go to those references that Dr. Wickens has, has listed here in her, uh, her presentation. Um, you can always reach out to your county agent too, just because we're not able to come, uh, or your parish agent, just because we're not able to come see you face to face anymore doesn't mean that we're not able to help you out through um, other methods. So thank you all and I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you for the opportunity, you guys. It was good to talk with y'all. All right, I'm going to stop recording.